amazing God, the merciful God, the long-suffering God. Oh Lord, we, we thank thee that thou hast not treated us as we deserve. Oh Lord, we come again on this Bible study to thank thee for the gathering of thy people. Oh Lord, certainly we do not wish to be anywhere else except to be at the feet of thy cross, at the feet of thy word, to, to receive blessings from above. Oh Lord, we thank thee that all things pertaining to life and godliness have been given to us, that indeed we have received great and precious promises. Oh Lord, we thank thee for free salvation. given to us because of thy, thy immense love towards each one of us. O oh Lord, we pray that thou would give us understanding. O oh Lord, deepen us in our most holy, holy faith. Help us to understand great things from above, deep things from above. We pray that thou would help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, visit us, bless us together, May this Bible study fit be to the glory of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, bless, bless the hymns that we presented before you. We pray that we will not just sing the words, but indeed we will reflect and ponder about among their meanings. But open up. Help us to be obedient children of thy word and to have a good testimony before those who are outsiders. Oh Lord, look upon us and bless us together in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
there is no power apart of God. The power shall be our obey of God. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. <coughs> For rulers are not the terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he heareth not the soul in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For, for this cause, pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministry, attending continually upon the very, this very thing. Render therefore all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any command, any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering or one and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof.
establish the kingship, the kingdom of God in men's and in women's hearts, and not to reform the society. Why? Because only the gospel, only the gospel can change the society, not even the right president or the right prime minister. And you find that people are praying for who was the, the, a godly president. Even if he is dead, he will be corrupted. So it is the gospel that is going to transform people's hearts. And we know, we know from our own experience and from our own conversion that when our hearts and minds and lives have been changed drastically, we have experienced a new birth, certainly there is a repercussion of a, on that in the society. And the citizens better students, better believers, better parents, better children, all the better is given to us as an outcome of conversion and regeneration. So again, it is not our business to overthrow 
and in front. But don't jump into conclusions. In a moment. My dear friend, there are many, many passages in the Bible dealing with our relationship between us and authorities. Just to give you a few of them, well known to them, to us, Matthew chapter 22, Mark chapter 13, you know those passages. Many, many, you have read them many times. And you come to Paul's letters, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Romans chapter 13, 1 Timothy chapter 2, Titus chapter 2. And now, but I want tonight really only to confine myself, to limit myself to what Peter has to tell us. Because remember, Peter, like Paul, and remember, my dear brothers and sisters, that Nero, the Caesar, was like a god. And the Christians in that time had to face this dilemma. You have to say, Caesar is God, Caesar is Lord, the Emperor is Lord, or you have to say, Jesus is Lord. And I can tell you, when you read church history, many, many believers refused at any time, at any point, to say that Caesar is Lord and boldly with the help of God even when they were put at the stake to be slaughtered to be killed and to be delivered unto wild animals they were still saying Jesus is Lord and they are in perfect harmony with the Lord Jesus Christ teaching us. So nothing new, it's all in the word of God. But my first point to put before you tonight is what are we to do? Living in a state, living in a nation, living in a country, being, being pilgrims, we spoke about that. Being you see, it is not something you have to be coerced. It is not something you have to be compelled to do. Submit the reflection. You have to do it willingly, but also voluntarily. You do. But you find in this verse, before we go any further, that you find in this verse two of the most hated words if they are misunderstood. They are not hated by believers, but I'm speaking generally in the world that these are two words, the most hated words in the world. The first one is the word submission, and the second one is the word ordinance, or if you prefer the word authority, the word power, the word uh, uh, government. These are words that we hate in our natural state. But you see, why do we hate them? Because our society defies authority. Why? Because most of the time, those words submission and the ordinance come with the, the negative connotation, meaning what? O o authority means oppression. Just for the authority. Authority means injustice. Authority means uh, autocracy. That's, that's <coughs> what the first idea that comes to us when we hear, we hear about authority. My dear friend, also the slogan in this uh, this last week is about extinction rebellion. Oh, uh, please allow me to insert a small preposition there. It should be really extinction of rebellion. Or you can change the order. It is better to change the order. Rebellion, extinction. Why? We all come into this world. I'm not making any political comment here, but that's, that's the, the, the point. We all come into this world as rebellious people. You know what? We celebrate 
the Nancy Bodley. We celebrate the undisciplined. We celebrate the insurrectionists. We celebrate the anti-system people. We celebrate the non-conformist uh, rebels. You, these are our heroes, we say to ourselves. Somebody like uh, of the type of uh, Nestor Guevara or who is Liv Biko, uh, Malcolm X, and with the list is uh, endless. These are the heroes because they are the rebels. But this is our state, each one of us, without, without salvation. From the beginning, you know that Adam and Eve rebelled against God. You know what Adam said? Authority upon my life. And by the fact that Adam rejected the rulership of God, he fell down and in falling down, he put down all the human race with him. And my dear friend, Israel, the nation of Israel, before God, have done likewise. Many, many times, God has to send a prophet to them to warn them about their rebellious hearts. My dear friend, why such decadence? Why such moral decadence in our world? And I'm sure you will agree with me that God has not created us and posted us in this world so that each one of us is, uh, is right in his own eyes. This is not why God created us and put us in this world. But what I need to do, look at the verse. Peter says, submit. And the word submit, I want to give you the simplest definition. Please, if I could win you on that, the word submission in the Bible is never and never, in my simple understanding of the Bible, is never with negative connotation. It is always, here is the meaning, to rank yourself under someone else willingly for a positive purpose. That's the meaning of submission in the Bible. And that's why from here on, Peter is going to use that word many, many times. And the first one is chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. He speaks about the submission of believers to authority. Then from verse 18 to 25, he speaks about the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. His, uh, his apostles are challenging us and calling us to imitate him. And look at verse 21, verse 23 there, you will see that we are called to walk in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ, who being God over all, the perfect man, but he made himself to be submitted and to be obedient to his father. Then you come to chapter 3, verse 1 to 17, it's all before you. Here it, he speaks about the submission of wives to their husbands. And then in chapter 3, he is, I don't want to give all the details, but just, just to, in one go, the rest of the, the, the letter, chapter 3, verse 8 to the end, he speaks about the submission of believers in the world, in the society, and at the end, he speaks about the submission of believers in the local church. But I want to remind you something. Just, I hope that I could bring that in your mind. The letter of Peter, the first letter of Peter, could be summed up in five words. Just five words. Salvation, sanctification, submission, suffering, and service. 
I would, you can study those five topics throughout the letter. Of course, there are many subheading, subtopics throughout the letter, but it's about salvation, sanctification, submission. Here we are coming to it, and later we shall study the suffering, but also the service of the believer. And many times you will find it's all about obedience. Being obedient, being obedient to the Lord, being obedient to, to the local uh, uh, authorities, the, ch the local church authorities, to be obedient to our uh, uh, civil and political authorities and so on. So all these things are given to us in, in First Peter here. My dear friends, I must proceed. There is no such thing as a just, holy, and righteous government in this world. There is no such thing. Why? Because the best government you can have in this world is deficient. It is deficient. For not to be seen in one way or the other. But you see, Peter says, we have to obey. We have to submit. And if you want the verses, we don't need me to give them to you. But six times in his letter, he calls believers to be obedient, no matter what the government we have ahead of us or above us. It doesn't matter what government, tyrannic, dictatorial, despotic, all these governments, God put them in that place for his purpose, for his sovereignty, his sovereignty, and they will give account to the living God. <coughs> so you can see, we have to obey to them. In the name of God. No one. You study. The Old Testament, people say the Old Testament is about murdering, it's about assassination, it's about massacre, it is a big lie. All the healing you find in the Old Testament are related to God's justice. That whatever is happening, God is going to judge this world. He's going to judge sin. He's going to judge the malefactors who are here. Any side to God to believe in Him, God is going to judge them. But you come to the New Testament, you will not. Saturday uh, on, on last Tuesday at Imperial College and at the bookstore here, we met people. When we invite them with a trap, we try to uh, engage conversation. It's really but they don't know their history. Why? Because all the words, the words which have come into this world have nothing to do with religion. You take it uh, in yet. Man's wickedness, man, man's sinfulness, man's evil thoughts and his. Uh, I fight every day against myself. So there must be, we pray. Uh, we had two Bible studies on the. My soul to revive. I want my life to revive and to, to be a better believer. Not only to look at the things at the surface, but to go. in a transient and ephemeral world. Oh, my dear friend, we have a whole to walk to fight. The 
second one is the one who sees every person is responsible for coming to the same knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Bringing every thought captive. Our sword is the sword of the spirit, not anything else. But I must proceed. Look at what Peter says. The second thing. Every ordinance of man. And it's interesting, that's why I read Romans chapter 13. It says that ordinance of God. The created order, the institution, the rule comes from God. But the This word, who could say theocracy? <coughs> Only the church is ruled by theocracy. The rule of God. The church, my dear friends, I don't In so many congregational ministers, we rule by the corporate. No, the church is ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. And you remember in the beginning, we wanted, we want a king like other nations. And you know what God said to them? Yes, you will have a king, but you have to suffer the consequences of. Unbearable. Why? Because they have rejected the rule of God. But the church is not led by opinion. The church is not the box populace, the box of the people. The church is ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ, by his word, by the Bible. We obey, we submit to the ordinances, the government, the authority, things are supreme and government, but we do not submit blindly. And I want to explain. I'm not giving you anecdotes, but I will give you what does the Bible say. When you go back to the beginning, in Exodus chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, but chapter 1, verse 15 to 21, you know what happened there, I'm sure. Jewish board. What have they done? They refused to obey. They saved the board. And when you read that, God blessed them. God blessed even the, the, those midwives. Why? The text says that they feared God. We will come to the fear of God in a, in a moment. But they feared God and they did not obey the Pharaoh's commandment because they feared God and they wanted chapter one, what happened there? <laughs> they had to follow the dietary laws of the, the emperor, of the king. But remember, this was not just about food. That's what some people are missing. Every, every meal, every plate in the Babylon So Daniel and his friends refused to eat meal.
very important. They obey God without dishonoring the king. And this is how we, how we should behave. As Everyone must bow down the knee before the statue, before an image. And Daniel said, never. I will never, as a believer, bow down the knee before a foreign God. Because I have only one God. Jehovah is my God. He made a good use of his Roman citizenship. This is something we as believers also, being citizens of a nation, we have rights. Yes, we have uh, privileges, we have obligations, but we have also some rights. And if I may list some, just the rights Paul had to claim in Are you allowed to be a Roman citizen? So he asked for his rights. <laughs> But we ask also for a fair case. He asked for a protective custody when, when he felt his life was in danger. He asked at one instance, I'm telling you this, you know, he asked at one instance if he could speak face to face with his accusers. But finally, the Supreme One at one stage, because he couldn't find justice with, uh, with the local That's why he was sent to Rome to find justice. But maybe we can speak about Peter himself. We don't have time to turn to the verses. In Acts chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, they beat them because they have spoken about the Lord Jesus Christ, gospelizing the society of, of their time. But the Sanhedrin, the council called them, and they were beaten, insulted, and so on. And when they repeatedly uh, continued to do the work of the Lord, uh, to be stopped again in uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 29. You know that there are many of us have memorized that verse. Think about it. We ought to obey God rather than my dear friends, you can see there, Peter did not cause an uprising or question the authority of the council. Even if that would cause them to go to prison. And my dear friends, when you read their prayer in, at the end of Acts chapter 4, their prayer there was a prayer of God. It's not God stopped the persecution. But their prayer was God give us boldness to preach. And if we obey the Lord, he will, he will come and be with us. That's why so many times in the word of God we said, fear no man. <laughs> the fear of man is a snare. It is a snare. My dear friends, we are not anarchists. You know the anarchists say to do. But the second, we are not extremist patriots. And the extremist patriots are saying what? My nation, my nation can't. Submit. And the, the, the extreme patriot, yes, we are patriots of our nation, but the extreme patriot says to himself, Oh, you know the text, seek ye first the kingdom. All lawful authorities, national, judicial, executive, legislative, parental, school, military, police, spiritual authority, 
every lawful authority we support it. But when a nation decrees My dear friends, we obey the scriptures. We obey the scriptures. what God, our first assignment, because God is our and Moses. And later he will say to Pilate in John chapter 19 verse 11, you have no other power that is not given to you from above. So even the power, those the autocratic powers have, it is one of them, and I can tell you, you can read later church history again, or our, our world history, many of them have been taken away in, the, in, the, in a big tragedy, the worst way, unexpected way, and they were moved by the power. But my dear friends, we have to submit to every ordinance, but never to sin or evil. Never. And our submission is not dictated or conditioned by the holiness or, or the justice of the government, of the regime. But now I come to a third point. Why are we to submit to every ordinance? Look at verse 13. This verse is pregnant with the great, great truths for our lives, for our behavior and conduct as we live in this world. And Peter says, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. That's the reason. That's the reason. For the Lord's sake. Imitating the Lord, honoring the We'll come to that in our next uh, study. But so far, my dear friends, the Jews, you remember, the Jews thought that when Christ comes, the Messiah comes into this world, he's going to establish the supremacy of the Israelites above all the world. But they missed the point that Christ came into this world to be obedient to his father, to submit to his father, and to drink the cup of wrath to its end, to take the punishment of every every sinner who is trust in him. I don't have time to read you the text again, but in Luke chapter 2, verse 51, Christ was obedient to his last events. He was not rebellious at any point in his life, though he knew the reason and the mission for which he came into this world. My dear friend, I give you three reasons given to us in the passage here why we submit to the authority. And the first one, which we already mentioned, is that for the Lord's sake, Paul says that also in Romans chapter 13, oh, not just because we fear the sword, not just because we fear the power, not just because we fear the fine. And second, verse 14, verse 15, and verse 19, that the verses are in front of you, so I want to comment. <coughs> In those three verses, it says, first of all, the second thing, why we obey, why we submit, first for the Lord's sake, and the second, for conscience sake, for the will of God's sake. So we obey to this, to this authority, and for our good sake. You see, it's all there. For our good sake, for our conscience sake, and also for God say the will of God, the sovereignty of God and his will. And obeying to them is punitive, but it is also rewarding. But we see, we are human. In our human nature, we only look at the punishment part. But there is also rewarding. That's why we do not fear them if we are obeying to the laws of the land. And my dear friend, our and the third one, 
The third one is given to us in verse 15, and it says there, to silence the foolish man, the unthinking man. To silence them with what? Not with arguments, but to silence them with our good works. And my dear friends, our submission is not a weakness, it is a weakness. What a big difference. So that's why there is no liberty outside the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, we have deep and lasting freedom. He died on the cross of Calvary to set us free from free will, from self-pleasing, and from self-will. Without him, we are all under the law of sin and death. But before I come to the last point, I want to give you eight questions you ask in order to understand. Is this something I can do as a Christian? Or is this something I should run away from? So eight questions to test our Christian liberty. Very simple. You, I can give you the verses for each one of them. They are all scriptural. And I hope this is practical and helpful to you. The first one, does it hinder my service for the Lord? So the first test to my Christian liberty, does it hinder my service for the Lord? The second, am I redeeming the time? Ephesians 5, 16. Am I redeeming the time? The third one, does it violate any part of the scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. The fourth, does it threaten my testimony? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. The fifth one, can I ask God to bless it? And that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. The sixth one, is it a stumbling block for someone else? Romans 14, verse 21. And as you know, our liberty is never to sin or to make someone else sin. Never. The seventh, does it harm me physically or spiritually? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 1 Corinthians 10, verse 22. And the last one, how does it advance the gospel? How does it advance the gospel? Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. And in verse 16, my time is over, but look at verse 616. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you of your good conversation in Christ. <coughs> my dear friends, our freedom, Christ died to set us from the works of the flesh. So that's why. Our freedom, our liberty in Christ is never anarchy. It's never license. It's, it's commandments. We are under every commandment given to us in the New Testament. We are under every law given to us in the Bible. We are not under ceremonial laws. That's finished. Christ fulfilled that at the cross of Calvary. But we are not without laws and rules. Freedom is to be free from the power of sin. Our guilt is over. Our guilt is lifted up by the Lord Jesus Christ. The curse of the law is removed. We are free from the fear of death. We are free from the dread of God's judgment. We have been saved from hell. And the Christian is a free man without freedom. Because he is saved from the slavery of sin to become now a slave of righteousness, a servant of righteousness. And at the end, Peter gives us four practical commandments. And the first one, he says, we have to honor all. I will come to that in our next study. The second, we have to love the brotherhood, the brothers and sisters in the church. The third, we have to fear God. And the fourth one, 
we have to follow him. So may the Lord bless us as we think about our Christian liberty in our proud Israel. Let's close our time together by singing hymn 467. Hymn number 467.